Welcome to Sponsored Post Podcast, behind the lens of how influential content is made. I'm Justin Moore. I'm the founder and CEO of Trending Family, which is an influencer marketing agency that launches campaigns with family-friendly influencers. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by Kevin Herrera, who is the co-founder and CEO of multi-company network, The Machine. Kevin has been at the forefront of the digital content revolution with experience as an agent at the Gersh Agency and directly managing influencers at Moopsie. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So why don't we kick it off? And why don't you share your story? Like, how did you get into influencer marketing to begin with? Purposefully, I carefully crafted getting into the space. And I no, I'm just kidding. It, uh, <laughs> it's probably like everybody else in this space, because it, it, it came out of nowhere in, in a way, but also at the same time, people that were reading the tea leaves knew that something was coming in this digital revolution and uh, UGC content creation world. So I cut my teeth at the Gersh Agency. I was a talent agent there, packaging agent in the alternative packaging department focused on emerging platforms. And then I left there after a few years of experience to start an influencer management firm called Moopsie, focused specifically on influencers. And at the time, we called them digital showrunners, but now they're just showrunners. And that side of the business has moved into our mother company, The the Machine, which I co-founded with one of the co-founders in Maker Studios and is a multi-company network focused on the, the merging of entertainment and advertising as the industry continues to grow. Talk a little bit about what a multi-company network is, because I'm not sure I've heard that term before. Yeah. So a multi-company network is, it's the next evolution of what the multi-channel network was. Ron was one of the co-founders of Maker, which is the biggest MCN that sold. It sold to Disney for, I believe, $650 million plus, And Disney incorporated it into their entire digital strategy, which is now Disney Digital Interactive, I believe, or Networks. And so the multi-company network is taking the good from that MCN 1.0 and adding what's happening new and getting rid of all the bad. So we brought together three different verticals of insanely talented, trend-setting companies and executives to be able to scale and downscale and do whatever is needed to fulfill the needs of brands, entertainment companies, and content creation. We create consumer-valued content. It's content that is intrinsically valued by the consumer and is the replacement for the TV commercial. As TV ad dollars are moving away from TV ad spend because it doesn't give the same ROI, what's the thing that's going to change? What's going to fill that void? Influencer marketing is a big part of that, but it's one part of a, a multifaceted solution to a problem that's rampant in the industry. And so, but really excited about what you guys are doing at Trending Family, working with you guys and doing more influencer marketing and, and also course correcting that because I'm sure you're seeing it too in the space. Now that it's getting popular, there's a lot of new entrants that aren't really doing things you know, above board or doing it to protect the talent and the brand. That's more so just to make a buck. And I know that's not where you guys are from. That's not what we're about either. We're about, you know, quality, valuable work being done. Yeah, absolutely. So it definitely seems as though MCNs, you know, multi-channel networks are on the decline, right? I mean, there's been a lot of consolidation, a lot of them gone out of business. This industry is just so quickly moving. And so what are the things that you think are like the good aspects of like the purest form of what an MCN was and can do for people? And what are the things that you think, you know, need to go away? Yeah, I mean, the good is that it's a space where if you have the the gumption, if you have the the wherewithal, you could go out there and you can make and you can create. The democratization of content creation and entertainment and communication on the internet has been absolutely amazing. And that's what allowed all these companies to proliferate. One of the biggest issues was that smoke and mirrors issue that came with growing valuations and exit strategies and focus just on the bottom line that came with the previous MCNs. And so that side of things we want to steer away from and get rid of and only focus on value creation and what's real. So the good thing to keep from that is these experts, these people that are the rock stars of this next generation of content creation, I liken it to the celebrity chef. Chefs weren't celebrities until a team of really talented managers came into the space and started working with them and helping them understand their value. And so a lot of the member companies, the people that we work with within our multi-company network, are like-minded in terms of the future of entertainment is in marketing and where they all merge. They're like-minded in where it's going, and they do something very, very good, very specifically. It's helping them focus and get more value out of what they do because they're able to focus. And that's another issue I think that came with the MCNs is there was a lot of... A lot just to have a lot as opposed to having 
greatness in a very focused manner. I want you to take me back in time a little bit to your days at Gersh. Help me get in the mindset of where you guys were at that time when you looked at digital creators. Because I mean, there's you know a couple of different types of creators, right? You've got the ones who want to break in to be traditional celebrities or have traditional media success. And then those that are digital first creators that really just needed help, like with, you know, managing their career, they didn't necessarily have these like giant aspirations. And I know a lot of these, you know, like the traditional talent agencies and some of these other management agencies sprung up and realized that there was an opportunity here, there was money to be made, careers to be developed. And yet now, as you mentioned, it sounds like a lot of digital first creators are being treated as traditional celebrities now. And so those like divisions in agencies are being absorbed into kind of these larger, like you said, mothership. So what was the mindset back then when all of this stuff was starting to happen? Yeah. I mean, I'd say from my perspective within the agency, it was an agency of like 200 agents plus across the United States and the world as well. It was very much that this is something that's new that we need to be a part of and that there is money to be made there. How can we provide value and how can we be helpful? Because the Gersh agency, from my understanding of the story of its origin, the original Gersh broke up the studio system for actors because actors used to have to work for one studio and they were signed there and they were locked up. And my understanding of the story is that he went in and he said, hey, friends, like you're my friends. I believe in you. What you do is amazing you could be doing so much more and have a higher price by not being monopolized by one studio. And so it was taking that same idea, not in terms of like breaking up a studio system, but of protecting, working for, and augmenting and adding to an influencer's career. And you know, early days there, it still is the Wild West in a very big way, the entire industry itself. But there was a lot of companies that were starting up, spending a lot of money on original content as well. You didn't necessarily need to have a following. You just needed to be a brilliant artist with a really strong POV. And if you had a following, this is before there was a merchandise solution around every corner. This is before everyone had written a book. This is before Grace Helbig even had her show on E!, you know, which was the first really big foray, I think, of a digital talent into a traditional medium. And now you see what uh, Lily Singh is doing with her late night show. It's really, really cool to see the evolution. And, and back then, it was just so, so brand new, especially for this entrenched business that's been around for decades to wrap their mind around how to engage with this type of talent. And to that end, too, the talent itself, this isn't your typical traditional, I'm an actor, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I'm coming up through and paying my dues. It's something that has been around for decades, and I know the path I could follow because I've been to school for it or I've been around it. This was everyone was cutting their own way through the forest. And so you had people that were extremely business savvy. You had people that weren't as talented as artists but were the business savvy people or people that were really talented artists that weren't as business savvy. And it was different for each talent. There wasn't one way to represent them, which I think made it extremely challenging and probably challenging for other agencies to catch up as well at the time. Tell me about, in your mind, what is the biggest difference between an agent and a manager when it comes to an influencer? Yeah, agent's job is solely to drive business as much as possible to the talent. The larger agencies, they have other departments that could help service other facets of the business, but their job is to be driving business to the brand that is the influencer that the influencer represents and has created. And a manager's job is to, I liken it to if you watch Game of Thrones, they're the hand of the king. Like their job is to be that right hand person for the talent and help guide them. Like in most cases, they're helping them find the right agent for them. They're helping manage the agent relationship. They're helping them find the different business opportunities that they could be spending time on and then getting the right team members in there to execute. They're an extension of them and in most cases are the business confidant who's protecting them in a very direct way and is in the trenches with them. Interesting. So I think one of the common refrains that I hear from a lot of influencers, especially those that are starting to grow and getting a lot of incoming deal flow, is that they want to partner with someone to help them kind of navigate all that. But there seems to be a lot of predatory behavior that goes on. When you look at traditional celebrities, pretty much everyone, if you're like, you know, C-list, B-list, A-list, like you have to have an agent, right? Like you have to have someone who's negotiating on your behalf, you know, adhering to all the guidelines and all this stuff. but as a digital creator, like you 
basically can manage yourself. Like if you have a lawyer, you know, maybe you can get them to look at the contracts. But, you know, a lot of creators still don't have managers, right? Like big ones too, right? And so how has that dynamic affected the industry in terms of like management in general? Because that really isn't a thing for someone to manage yourself as a traditional celebrity, right? Yeah, because it just it takes a lot of time. And that's something that is not something you could get more of. And that's something that I think that, like we've talked about already, that there's been decades of people before them. And this is the first decade we're coming to the end of it where this talent was talent. You know, go back to the 1920s. By the time it was 1930, that's the silent versus talky era. And those are movie stars for the first time. This is the first decade influencers have been around. And so what I think that they're missing out on from my traditional background being an agent before and seeing and learning the history of this industry through being a part of that at that agency is that time is the biggest part of it, I think. And that time then equates to money. And so you extrapolate it down and that talent's leaving money on the table or losing potential value in their business because they don't have that person or that group that's protecting them. The whole commission-based work is because we as representatives only make money when the talent makes money. And so we're incentivized just through basic economic incentives to make the most money possible for the talent and protect them and their brand. Even if we're not like you're talking about like there's unethical stuff that happens, like regardless of that, just looking solely at black and white numbers, we're incentivized to do the best work we can on behalf of the talent because that's how we work with them. And it's a 10% thing because the talent's the one that's doing the work that's in the trenches, that's putting themselves out there. I tell this to my clients in confidence and so now people are going to hear this, but there was a point in 2006, you know, college time when like I started up a YouTube channel, like was making some content as a creative person and I put up one video and I got a bunch of hate on that video, which is good if you can weather it. Like some of these people who have turned hate into like big followings and and a bunch of money, but it's visceral. You feel it, even if it's a comment. So whenever a brand or an agency or somebody doesn't understand when a talent's worried about posting something, it's a visceral feeling when a comment comes in that's negative. You're putting yourself out there. So they have the majority of the percentage of the money that's coming in. They're doing all that work. And our job to augment and make more of that money and take a small percentage of it is why a representative is important because you could do more work and make more money and be more happy in most cases because you have more time and whatever you need with a representative. Interesting. So there is this kind of tension, right? Like there are a lot of creators who are really in it for the pure artistry, right? Like they just love making content. You know, they know that branded content and sponsorships and deals and things needs to be in a meaningful part of their overall business strategy. But at the same time, you've probably experienced this with some of your clients, like they just really love making content and not really any of the business side of stuff. And so I definitely see the value in terms of like having a key person on your team, like a manager to like help navigate that and kind of insulate, you know, talent from those types of things. One thing I'm curious your perspective on is that as a traditional celebrity, like that's one thing. But what I have seen happen, and I think has frustrated some creators that I've talked about, is that the talent manager, they may represent not just that digital creator. Maybe they represent 10 or 15 other people. And essentially a deal will come into that particular influencer. And then, you know, the manager responds and says, like, hey, you know, thanks so much. We'd love to talk terms or whatever. Do you need other talent? Like I also represent these other 10 people or something like that. And the gripe that I've heard has been, hey, this deal came into me. And now what if this brand sees this list of 10 other people you represent and decides to work with them instead of me? How do you navigate that conversation when you're first talking with the talent about representing them? Yeah, I mean, for us personally at Moopsy and through our work with the machine, if there's an incoming request like that, we see it through all the way for that talent first. And if it goes to the talent and they don't want to do it, or it doesn't match or doesn't fit for them for whatever reason, then we get that to other talent on our roster and our multi-company network to other people who could fulfill that. But at least for us, how we do business is we don't take that request and then turn it into more immediately. It sounds like a really good business practice for the business itself, not thinking about the interpersonal (laughs) and the ethics side of things. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, like we're a management firm. We're not just an agency. Like There's agencies out there that do that work. I know that we can be helpful in helping these agencies source more talent and cut through, I guess, the muck and the baloney that's out there because there's a lot of it in the space and there's no like police out there that's kind of helping things go. There's no you know, SAG-AFTRA is trying to get into the space to help you know, protect the influencers and talent. 
And that's where we come from with our company and, and our mantras. Like, is it's talent first and it's helping the talent and protecting them. So it's a good question. And it's I've heard similar problems in the space. Yeah. What's the latest with sag After and, and what they're trying to do to kind of, you know, muscle their way back into this space to have more relevance? Yeah. You know, I felt it was a little bit that way too, until I met with a representative there and I had found out, you know, cause I had been talking to them for a bit, but they had been meeting with a lot of different managers in the space, a lot of different agents in the space, learning about it and figuring out similar to what I was doing at the Gersh agency. There is a few executives internally at SAG that are the people that are spearheading growth into this side of the business. And they're finding out what the pain points are for the talent, for the representatives and crafting this future of representation for influencers and for digital talent. At least from my perspective, I'm not a SAG representative or in there. I am a member of the guild, but I'm not an executive there. But from what I've seen, it's actually going to be pretty great. They're talking to the ad agencies as well, because there's this entire commercial union side of things for television commercials that is already in existence. And so it's how do they modify that and adjust that to fit the needs of everybody, not get in the way of business, but protect. Because, you know, there's family channels out there. You, you work with a bunch of family channels and they have multiple kids most times, not all the time, but most times. If that family of seven people could have health insurance after doing two branded integrations, that is really great health insurance. Why wouldn't they? I and mean, I think it'd be really great to protect and help them, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get there because there's a lot of nuance. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, especially in the family space, like you see this, you know, a lot of news articles about kid influencers and how they're not subject to the same legal requirements that kid actors are, you know, or kids in commercials. And so it's just really still this very gray area in terms of like how talent is treated with respect to the letter of the law. I want to talk a little bit about what your talent roster is like, you know, in terms of, you know, the types of platforms that your creators are on and kind of their following size and what is kind of your specialty? Yeah. So we're directly on the Moopsie roster. We have a lot of family friendly comedy and family friendly creating content. We have people from micro influencers to mid tier to top tier influencers, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers, tens of thousands of followers to millions of followers across all platforms. TikTok has recently been popping off and a lot of our talent has started to get on the platform and figure out their voice there. It just really depends on what a entertainment executive is looking for, what like, what a buyer is looking for. People that range from creators that do video game, live streaming and playing to family channels that do vlogs and that make wholesome content. But everybody, super positive, brand friendly is key, right? Because it's branded integrations. Some can be edgy, but for the most part, everybody is just a really good person who loves making content and has a very engaged audience. And how involved do your creators typically want you to be in their business dealings? Is it the kind of thing where they just forward you all incoming deal flow and they want you to handle all the you know briefing calls? Or is it shades of gray in terms of the types of relationships you have with everyone? Yeah, it's definitely shades of gray because every influencer and every talent has a different way they want to do business. But in general, we have a flow with how we work with ad agencies and how we work when we're doing branded integrations because that's a lot of the business for the talent that we work with. And then depending on where they're at in their careers, there's helping them find the right team members to flesh out the rest of their team. If they're doing merchandise, if they're doing books, it's, it's whatever their goal is as a talent, we're setting up a long-term plan and then backing up to today and taking those next steps with them. So what's your perspective on what the role of a manager should be when it comes to facilitating brand deals? Because I mean, every agency and every brand manager, some of them want to like actually talk to the talent themselves, right? Like get on the phone, hear some of their ideas about how to bring this campaign to life. So do you encourage that type of relationship or do you think it's important to keep them at arm's length a little bit and insulate the talent a little bit from the brand representatives? Yeah, middle ground for sure on that one. How we work with all of our talent is the deal-making process. We work with their lawyers to make sure that the deal is where it needs to be, that they're happy with everything, the deliverables are what they're looking to do and what they're comfortable with doing, what it all means, and then walking them through that deal with their lawyer 
facilitating that and making that paperwork process smooth for their lawyers. And then once that's done, we typically have a kickoff call where our talent is present on the call and that they're in there being the star that they are and being the ideation idea factory creator that they are and sharing what their vision is for the plan for it all. When it comes to direct communication, if they're on site with something, you know, we're there to, to help them out and help facilitate and make things smooth. But what we do in our job, we see is to stay out of the way of the content creation process and make sure that it's just smooth and easy for everybody on all sides. And I think that's why agencies like working with us just making sure that everything is just really smooth and easy. Everyone's protected on both sides, but we're aligned fiscally with our talent. And so it's always going to err on their side of things. But ideally, it's a reciprocal relationship and everybody's feeling good and it's moving really smooth and fast. You mentioned in terms of the contracting process, I want to talk a little bit about that. Like, How has contracting evolved over the years in your mind? I mean, at least from my experience, I've seen some absolutely insane clauses. Like back in the <laughs> early days of influencer marketing, there were just the, you know, perpetual ownership and like usage in crazy areas that the talent didn't understand that that was going to be happening. So like, what are kind of the extra steps that you think need to take place when contracting through a talent manager agent? I know you mentioned like, you know, one of your chief goals is to be your talent's advocate, right? And so how do you think through that process? 100%. There's starting to be standards. Like if I say an organically integrated video versus a dedicated video, more people are going to understand what that means off the bat without an explanation. When I was an agent at Gersh, it was daily hours of calls educating the other side on how to work with an influencer. There was one brand, a huge Fortune 500 brand, that their legal department didn't have deals to work with influencers. So we had to make it up with our legal department and bring it to them. And I'm sure it's still now part of their standard on how they deal with influencers. And that's something we built for them because they just didn't have it. And so like since then to now, the terminology has gotten a little bit more focused there's a more shared understanding and less educating. There still is that. There's still new entrance to the influencer marketing space and branded integration space. That's the biggest difference, I'd say. And then in terms of like the facilitating it and how it works and how we are best advocates for our talent is we know right when we start working with them, one of the first questions we ask is, what does your inventory look like? How do you typically do integrations? What does your audience respond to best? Because there's some influencers that have trained their audience to understand that they do branded integrations to keep bringing them really great content. There's some verticals where any kind of branded integration is looked at poorly and you have to be very careful with how you navigate things. So a brand could come from one vertical of talent to another and think it's exactly the same. In most cases, it's not. And so understanding that for the talent and being an advocate in that area helps things a whole lot from the very get-go is knowing, yes, they're down to do those types of deliverables because their audience will consume this in the best way possible. And that was a learning lesson for me as an agent at the time too, was understanding that the talent are the experts. They know their audience better than anybody because they're with them every single day. As a brand or as an agency, you're not just paying the influencer to make the video. You're not just paying them to distribute on their platform, but you're paying them for their consultation expertise to know how to reach their audience best and get your messaging in front of them. Yeah. So what are the main levers that you use for pricing is, I mean, the main ones that most people I think look at are like the statement of work, like how many posts it's going to be the, you know, the medium, is it going to be a pictures or video, which platforms, exclusivity, terms and usage, paid media rights. Is that all kind of summarize the types of things you look at? Or are there any other kind of deal points or clauses that you think are critical that most influencers aren't really thinking about when they work with a brand? Totally. We typically ask like creative ask, social deliverables, exclusivity is key, how it's going to be used. I think that's the paid media side of things, but that's ever evolving. So being really careful with that television commercial was worth X in the past. And those are usually covered by the union. Is this going to be a union spot if it becomes a commercial? Is this going to be used as footage within a larger campaign? I think the usage right timeline is really important. The exclusivity is super important as well because if you're highly in demand or if you're an influencer that doesn't have a talent representative or even a lawyer or something and you're just on the come up exploding, a lot of people are going to be coming your way. 
And if you're an influencer listening and you're that person, find somebody that is already working with a representative and get a recommendation on somebody that you could trust to. And at the very least, find a lawyer that understands influencer marketing and branded integrations. And in the worst, worst case, just find an entertainment lawyer because it's super, super important to have somebody watching out for you. But in terms of clauses, I think the exclusivity and the usage term, which are sometimes different, are really important. What would be really bad is if the exclusivity is a few days before and after a post, but the paid usage is an entire year. And there's also a clause in there that says they could re-upload it again without permission. And then you get a really big brand deal nine months later, and that brand is a competitor and they post it again. You could be in breach. So that's something that I'd look at if you had no representatives at all and you had to look for one thing that could mess you up later, I would look for that. Talk me through how traditional celebrity endorsement deals look like. And I'm curious, like how similar they are to digital creators, because traditionally, celebrities do these kind of like longer term partnerships versus what influencers do where they, you know, they'll kind of hawk a lot of products, right? (laughs) You know, a lot of them will endorse quite a few different brands in many different categories. So do you see the clauses in terms of like, how the name and likeness are utilized? Is there like, a big difference between traditional celebrities and influencers? Yeah. I mean, in terms of the likeness use, from what I've seen, and again, I'm not an expert and I'm not a lawyer, so don't quote me on it, is that it's similar in terms of like the likeness use because they need the right to use your likeness alongside the product if they're doing paid media and other work as an influencer with the work product that you create. Similar to if they shoot a commercial with Jennifer Aniston holding a smart water, they need the use of her likeness and the right to use her likeness when they're putting up a billboard or something like that. So those are similar, maybe not exactly the same, but similar. And I think that years past, a Jennifer Aniston is going to be worth astronomically more than an influencer, even if the influencer has a more engaged, bigger following, because at the time that wasn't understood that those numbers and those eyeballs were real and that they converted. But now the time has changed. I think that's going to start evening out or even flipping between influencers and like somebody like a Jennifer Aniston, even though she just got on Instagram and gained billions of followers in one day because of a friend's post. So she's getting into the influencer game. But the big thing and the huge difference that I'd say if this is a brand listening or an advertiser listening or even a talent is that when you're a traditional celebrity, you've built your celebrity through the work that you've done on other people's platforms that you don't own and control for the most part. Whereas an influencer, they're building their own platform. It isn't one they control necessarily because Google at the end of the day could turn the lights off if they wanted to, but it's their own home base that they've created with their own audience. And this is not an educated like thing that I've read or studied or anything, but I venture to guess that similarly to how when they were on Friends, there was branded integrations throughout the entirety of the show, product placement and everything. Then they go and do endorsement deals. Then they go and do television commercials. It's similar to like an influencer. The influencer controls the NBC because they are the NBC that's putting the content out. They're also the development arm. They're the branded sales arm if they don't have a, a team behind them. Like they're all of it in one. So it's a harder job for less money historically, but it's starting to even out. Yeah, interesting. I kind of wanted to chat through a campaign that went particularly well for one of your talent because I always love to highlight those types of things. So is there a campaign that jumps to your mind, perhaps where maybe the role that you played helped make it particularly successful? Yeah, I mean, I'd say there was two that jumped straight to mind. One of them was with a large car company. And I don't know if my talents, video and ideation influence the way that they do their commercials and their content moving forward, or if it just happened at the same time. I'd like to think it was my talent's ideas that it was so successful that it ended up being used throughout all of their content. But that was something where it was an incoming request from an agency looking for a talent that matched a certain vibe. We had a very specific talent that was a perfect fit the singular talent, not here's our entire roster, but here's a very specific talent that would fit exactly what you're looking for. And the contract process was figured out with his lawyer. All of it was all done. They got on the creative call. It was the absolute perfect fit. Not only 
demographics wise and content wise, but his ideas fit perfectly with what the agency was looking to do. The content was executed. He was from out of state, but they wanted to shoot here in California. So I went out and did a little bit of scouting for him in terms of like locations and stuff. So that part of it was a little bit above and beyond what a typical manager would do, more of like a producer role. And then they came out and shot. It was fantastic. They put it out there, performed really well. And I think the video influenced the rest of their campaigns moving forward for the next few years. But also, I can't you know, guarantee that that's exactly what happened. Maybe it was happening at the same time. And then another one was uh, a live shoot. So it was a holiday campaign around a large brick and mortar store. And one of the MCNs actually was the ad agency on it. And they had reached out to find a talent, again, that would fit a certain demographic and fit a certain vibe content-wise. We suggested one that we thought was specific and the right fit. They ended up going with them. The ad agency loved them. The brand loved them. And it started out as just like a you know one video thing with a little bit of a live shoot and it ended up going above and beyond. Multiple videos, multiple posts, performed really well for the brand, was an all-in-all really great shoot. And it was multiple kids in the video live streaming. It was this crazy big thing. And through the work that we were able to do together, ad agency being the MCN, the brand and the talent, everyone was able to come together very quickly to make something very high level and very premium. And it ended up performing really well for the brand. Are you seeing like a lot of interest still in live? Because I know that there's a lot of especially traditional advertisers that are still very scared about that in terms of not being able to have their legal team look at things before they go live. Yeah, there is. And we actually have one of our member companies, Hovercast, has a a solution for this, which we're really excited and why we're so stoked to be working with them, where they have a dashboard that they've created that allows for ingesting of data from multiple different live streaming platforms through their APIs that are available. And it's its own moderation platform. So you can moderate comments and see what goes forward and have a little bit of a delay, almost like what it would be like to do a live broadcast on an NBC, but you're able to do it on your own PC or your own Mac. And so there's definitely a, an opportunity for that in the space. And so from your perspective, a brand that's just entering this space, how do they navigate this ecosystem? I mean, it's like super confusing, right? Like there's so many influencer agencies out there, so many platforms, there's still MCNs. There's just so many people in this space that I feel like I would be overwhelmed if I was a brand manager or something. So what would be your recommendation if you had the ear of like a Fortune 500 brand manager? Call up Trending Family. (laughs) Yes, there we go. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, but joking aside, like for real though, there are a few different agencies in the side of the business that have history and that have been doing this for a long time and have taken the licks early and understand and have optimized to work with brands and other ad agencies. And so if it was somebody who was brand, brand new to the business, I'd first ask them, have they done their research on who their audience is and who their consumer is? Because if they don't have those specifics, it's not going to go well for them. Nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10. You need to know who your audience is because your audience consumes differently than an audience and a consumer that some other brand is marketing to is. It's no longer a four-quadrant blanket approach. If you are a four-quadrant company, you have to attack each quadrant separately in their own way. And the more specific you get, the better. And so doing that research first, and then at that point, taking that information, which in the form of an RFP or however they want to do it, out to ad agencies. And transparency, I think, would be really important and is key. There's agencies that will go to their brands, from what I've heard, even from brands at different events and talking to them that say, oh yeah, we can get this person. We have this person. They don't have that person. (laughs) They win the business on saying that person's name and then they go and they have to get it. And then when they can't get that person because the price doesn't make sense for them, then they go and get someone to fill that gap. That doesn't look good for that talent. And that talent doesn't even know that that's happening. So for us, you know, we have a direct roster of people. We also have a network we work with through our multi-company network. And then we have colleagues and people in the space that we work with that we know directly. So if it's somebody that we say we can get, it's because we directly have a relationship with them. Kind of to wrap it up here, I'm curious, what do you think is next for the future of influencer marketing, the future of talent representation? What are your thoughts there? 
Yeah. I mean, I think for the talent representation side of things, it's been a business that's been around for decades. There's a lot of experts that are in the space representing the traditional talent and that traditional talent is coming into the digital space and the digital talent is going into the traditional space and all of that's going to be merging into one. And so talent is just going to be talent, which to people like ourselves who've been in the business for a decade plus now, it's always been just talent, but it's been people trying to catch up to understand that, that these people with internet followings are real celebrities. It's niche-based, very, very focused. And I think Netflix has realized it because they're spending another $2 billion of debt on content. YouTubers have known this for a while. Your relevancy is based on the last piece of content that you put out. And so if you're a premium content creator, your relevancy is based on your last premium piece of content you put out. So you got to put out a lot of it. And so the niche-based, focused audience attack is where it's really going to be at. And so for creators that are listening hone into your POV and hone into what you do and get as specific as possible because there's at least four to five brands that need that voice and just be the best for those specific four to five brands. That's an entire career. And for the brands that are listening, don't be scared to focus and just to be very, very focused with where you spend and how you spend because that's where engagement lies is on bringing to your audience and the consumer you're targeting exactly what they're looking for that enriches their life. And that's where like the whole consumer value content mantra comes from. And that could be anything from an Instagram post for a beauty vlogger or beauty vertical that you're focused on all the way to a scripted series that is on an AVOD channel like Pluto that Viacom bought for a lot of money. It just really depends on what's relevant to your audience. And so that's the future and talent and storytellers are always going to be important for that. And that's why it's really exciting to be a creator in this day and age of entertainment marketing. It definitely is. I definitely is why I love it. Thank you so much, Kevin. And how can uh, people contact you or find out more information about The Machine? Yeah, totally. You can go to themachine.la. You could follow us at The Machine LA on all social media platforms. And you could check us out at moopsy.com, M as in Mary, O-O-P as in Paul, S-Y.com, or at Moopsy on all socials. Awesome. You've just listened to the Sponsored Post podcast with your host, Justin Moore. You can subscribe to hear more great interviews and episodes via Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information on Trending Family, you can visit trendingfamily.com. See you next time.